Welcome in, you two. Welcome in, Juicebox and your pusher man. Glad to have you here. Um, if you, I already introduced both of you, but if you would like to introduce yourselves to my chat, um, ch chat, hi, I'm Lumi Rue. You might know me. You might have heard of me. Potentially, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm here to chat with Juicebox and your pusher man. Of course, you see me around Twitch because this is my Twitch channel. But Juicebox, are you on Twitch? What do you do around this this area? Well, I'm glad you. Um, I just so ha happen to be one of your uh, lousy mods that you have in your, your server as well as your Twitch uh, Twitch channel. Um, but and I've been doing that for about like four months, four or five months, something like that. Yeah, something like that. You've if, been around. If, um, my, what I, I mean, I do the work that all of our other lovely mods do. Um, but outside of that, I do a lot of uh, speaking engagements. Uh, be that at middle, either middle or high school students uh, in my school district around my area or in different school districts in my county. Uh, I've been doing that ever since I graduated high school back in 2014. And that's been like, in addition to going to school for a medical uh, degree path, I'm uh, this talking, having these conversations with uh, hope is basically my passion. And uh, in addition to doing those speaking game engagements, I also write poetry and perform that as well i've been writing poetry for about like i don't know since i was like 10 10 11 but i've just recently been um performing it as of last year and so far it's been going pretty good well so that's fantastic that's, that's, that's... yeah if you ever have some poetry you want to come share with us feel free to i'd love to hear it sometime that's incredible sounds good Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, welcome into your pusher, man. I believe you're a streamer on the platform, right? Uh, you can say that. I don't really, I do it for my own, I guess, research as I'm playing my games to go back and check to see if I could do something better or faster. Um, and it's mostly Division 2 right now. And uh, yeah, I just found Twitch maybe a year ago, just following different streams, playing Division 2. So that's just been my life with, the, with with twitch so far well we're glad to have you here thank you so much for joining us i really appreciate that i actually wanted to start by asking you a question surrounding you you used to teach high school history here and we mentioned this in your introduction but now you're teaching in dubai would you like to expand on that a little bit tell us your story why did that happen um I wasn't normally a teacher. Uh, it's a family profession. Mm -hmm. And most like like most people who are trying to avoid the family business, I decided to go and try to do business at Howard University. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do marketing advertising. And seeing like the influence of my parents, my mother, my father, and then my family, I just decided to move to Japan uh, in 2005 when I graduated mm -hmm. and taught English there. And I loved it. I just loved my impact in the classroom. I love teaching with the young kids. And then when I came back in 2018, sorry, 2008, I decided to get my master's. Uh, that's when I met my wife, we got married, uh, had, we have twins, a boy, girl, twins. And I've been teaching since then. This is my, I just finished my 15th year. We have one more, well, three more days of school. And I, I love the classroom. Uh, I'm, I'm originally from the north suburbs of Chicago which is Evanston, Illinois, and growing up, growing up there, seeing the small racial disparities there had me go to Howard. And after going to Howard, I'm like, I need to get back to my, you know, my city. And so living on the South side, living, teaching on the South side, loving just the atmosphere. And I believe around the time of like 2015, 2016, when the whole Laquan McDonald thing happened, I, I was in school teaching and my kids know me just for being progressive and being revolutionary with my content and they were asking like mr murray let's 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 go you know let's go walk let's go let's go protest and i'm like uh do you have these things in order so they would come back every single time with 
you know, what they didn't have. And by the fifth time, they said, let's do it. And so my ninth through 12th grade class, we walked out school, walked down the street um, and on the south side. It was about like what, five blocks. And we got um, escorted by like 75 police officers. And at that point, um, we're walking around, you know, the block near the south side where, where we live. And we're walking around the crosswalk because, you know, if you know the laws, you don't you can't stop and impede traffic. But if we're walking with the law, we're good to go. So we just have to walk. Um, my, my kids are between the age of 14, 18, and the police are being rough with them. Like the, the, the abuse that they're seeing back in 2015, they're actually seeing it firsthand. And mm -hmm. so I'm like, you guys are fine. You know, hold your ground. You're good to go. You're not any laws. And so as I'm saying that, you know, the captain or sergeant, you know, walkie talkie and, you know, single me out. And so next thing I know, I'm in hands. And it was, it was the point where they all marched towards me. And at that point, the entire school was up in arms about to go off. And I had to say, listen, calm down, stop. I'll be okay. They dragged me off, detained me. And it was to the point where they saw the real life in action. And after that, I became more vocal on social media, on Facebook. And so as I'm talking with people, you know, discussing this issue, you know, I get, you know, the, the not so nice, you know, why don't you just leave the country if you don't like where you come from? And I said, cool. And I'm out. So okay. I just took my family and we decided to go to Dubai. And we've been here since 2016. And it's 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 been a very much. It's been interesting, to say the least. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> How do you feel being in Dubai? Do you feel like things are a bit better? Do you still have concerns? Are you happy you moved there? Are, are you still teaching history? Uh, the last question, yes, still teaching history. I don't think I can teach anything else. Uh, math, I don't do well with numbers. After the number 10, I get lost. Um, <laughs> science, not really good with science. Um, but I love history and English, so I, I teach history. Being out here when things are transpiring back home, it's, it's like that disconnect where mm. you are I, I feel it, but I don't feel it. And I, we've been sharing around an article in, my, in our group that talks about this idea of when stuff happened with um, uh, Ahmed Arbery and Breonna Taylor and everybody else, George Floyd, it was this idea of like, your black coworkers are not okay. And it was an article that we've been sharing around reading it. And that's how we felt where internally we're struggling and we still have to go to work and put on a happy face. And in the words of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, we got to wear these masks that show you know, what they don't want to see and what we can't show. And so that was, that's the hardest part of how do I, knowing my activism, knowing my, my passion, how do I help? How do I do say whatever when I'm thousands of miles away? And like, what's my, what's my place? And then how do I raise black twins mm -hmm. to understand this who are seven and, and understand how this works? where they don't experience it out here. Like the, the racism is not really as prevalent. The colorism is very big and that's a whole different story, but the racism is not as prevalent with me as a black American because I don't get second looked at. I can actually feel like I'm free. The cops pass me by and I mean, I get nervous automatically, but they just pass by and it's like, oh, okay, I have nothing to worry about. So it's really not, it's, it's so, it's, it's what the book uh, was called. It's called um, post-traumatic slave syndrome. This idea of we are we are stuck in this mentality of America has abused us so much. We travel overseas. It hurts where every little thing I still, you know, wash my back, I, you know, hear bangs, you know, whatever. And that that to me is unnerving and having to get out that mindset of you're fine. Like you're not going to have the same physical, emotional, spiritual abuse here that you would back in, you know, in the States. Absolutely. Um, Juicebox, do you have any experiences with that regarding the police? How do you feel on the police? Do you feel like you would have a, a similar um, experience, <clears throat> feelings? Yeah, so um, my growing up, uh, uh, I live in Texas. I've grown up in Texas ever since I was five or six. I moved here from, we moved here with my family from Florida. And uh, for any not from the South, uh, things can be pretty uh, pretty dangerous if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, right? Mm -hmm. Or even if you're at the right place at the wrong time. Um, I've had my fair share of uh, interactions with the cops as early as when I was 
uh, six or seven uh, with my dad. I remember one time we were going driving through down through uh, East Texas and uh, uh, going through like this town that's known for a speed trap. It's like a town of like less than probably less than 2000 people. So like all their most of their money they get from like tickets of people driving through going through, you know, a bigger area, a bigger city. Mm-hmm. And uh, we got pulled over, and it was just like three o'clock in the afternoon. We got pulled over by a cop. Um, he told Dad that uh, his, his tail light was out. But again, three o'clock in the afternoon. What does it matter? That that's a, obviously a bullshit excuse, right? Um, we were just talking a little bit about how I've noticed that that same struggle of having to go to work when all of this is happening, and having to still wear that smile and try to power through it. Is this something that you're talking to your coworkers about at all? Or are your coworkers aware? Mm. The short answer is no, mm. because the, the reason why we're still in Dubai, we still are on um, social distancing as far as schooling. Mm. So we have been, I believe, April, mid April, uh, they decided to cancel all face to face schooling. So we've been e-learning since mid April. And so with that, it's hard to get in contact with people and see that because they don't see us every day. So we're, you know, you're at home uh, with, you know, who you're with. And then offline, you know, we have groups. So we have a group with, you know, the black educators that we talk with and we have these discussions. So aside from that, we know and it is it is hard to bring in anybody who really and my, my wife and I were talking about this idea of how do you how would I feel if a a person that I don't talk to on a daily basis comes up to me at school and says, you know, are you feeling okay? I was like, why would you ask? You know, but the people that I'm cool with that are, that are not black, I get that. So it's, it's really difficult. This is as, as uncomfortable as it is for anybody who's non black to discuss it. It's just as uncomfortable for us because we don't know how to tell you because we're used to holding it internalizing it and then Mm. dealing with on the side with our people. So that's where it's like, it's that idea of like, do you talk? Do you say something? And I'm really, we're we're all at at odds of like, what do we do? And that's the hardest part. That makes sense um, for (laughs) sure. I know that uh, it seems like Nick has also been having that struggle of like, do I talk to my coworkers about that? And is that something that's, that's I'm comfortable doing as well? What are your thoughts? Are you experiencing this at your work juice box at all? Yeah, so like, this is it's actually something I've been um, thinking about for forever now. Like even when I was in uh, in grade school, because uh, I I was one of those kids that I didn't wait until history class for me to learn something about my history. Right? Mm-hmm. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a household where um, I was taught that my history was to be told through you know a holistic sense. Uh, for me to get all perspectives of everything that happened to me. Um, my history is actually a little, maybe a little bit unique to to uh, this conversation. Uh, my whole family is actually from Jamaica. Um, my Me, my sister, and my brother are the, or me and my sister were the first to be born in the state. So um, we would learn, so my mother and my, my, my father would teach me uh black american history as well as uh jamaican history oh wow so going so yeah so going through yeah so going through school um like middle school school high school i would i would already know about malcolm x marcus garvey and then even more about like kwame Ture and angela davis and the true story or true uh civil rights uh history of um of say rosa parks right not just the the bus boycott but you know everything before that working um for women's rights we've been uh, uh, helping black women that have been uh, sexual assault victims uh, years prior to you know giving up her seat on the or not giving up her seat on the bus so like going through school like hearing people talk about these kind of things when it would come up every now and again it there there's a part of me that's just like Okay, I I should say something if somebody's being ignorant. There's, if somebody is trying to have a conversation, whether they're 
good intentions or bad intentions, but they're not quite really getting ex the point of of you know where they should be at. I, I really want to say something, but there's always been this like sort of trepidation within myself that if I go out and talk about this, how much energy do I have mm -hmm. in my day to devote to talking to these people, right? To possibly educate from the ground up what exactly they need to know so they can have these conversations. And while I think I, to, in some cases, people in my immediate circle, people who I regularly interact, interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, and this goes for work, school, uh, even online, then at some point it is my responsibility to say at least something you know, I don't have to necessarily go out and, you know, read a whole, like, history timeline with them, but I am I feel like if I'm in this space and I'm talking and I'm, you know, interacting with, again, we're interacting with these people constantly, it is my responsibility to at least try something, right, at least once. And if that doesn't go, and if that doesn't amount to anything uh, substantial, or if I decide that it's it's not worth my time and energy to keep going with this, then you know I can feel free to move out of that space or do some other devote my divert my energy into something more uh, more productive. Mm -hmm. And recently, I've had a, I've been having to uh, kind of like toe that line like pretty much yeah. every day with as these conversations are coming out more and more and more and I know pretty much every circle that I'm in so that's that's where I'm at with that absolutely and that goes back to the whole idea of of mental health like you know Rumi you talk about this idea of you know mental health and mental awareness it's as you said it's exhausting it's it's uh mm -hmm. my twins learned about this in like KG2 this idea of you know um bucket fillers or um bucket dippers like you have a certain you have a bucket and your bucket has a certain amount of energy for yourself and so you are either going to be you know pouring yourself out for other people but are you going to have people pouring into you so if we are constantly able and constantly having to pour ourselves out and explain and explain who is helping filling our buckets when it's like we get back to our family it's like i'm done i just don't like talking leave me alone and then that's not fair for my you know my family and my kids and so we as as you said we pick and choose our fights and at a certain point we'll we'll do it that one time and if you show that you're not worth our time, I'm, I hate to say it, but like, I'm done with you because I, I don't have the energy. Um, and it's like passing the buck, but at a certain point it's like, when, when do I get my, you know, breathing and my break from just life? Absolutely. And so that's something like, this is something I talk about to relate, relate it a little bit to queer issues um, as, as a non-binary person with a community full of uh, trans individuals. I th it kind of almost reminds me of like trying to date people who aren't, who don't know anything about my identity. And suddenly you're having to teach from the ground up. And, and when I think about this, like, absolutely. I think what you say with the, you know, the buckets, are you always pouring out or is someone pouring into you? Are you getting that energy? And something I think of that would make this so much easier is if we weren't putting that on you to educate or on queer people to educate about our identities or our history or the struggles we face in society, but we maybe lean on our institutions a little. Maybe we should be learning Black history as a part of U.S. history, not as like a side thing. And so I wanted to dive into um, Juicebox. I wanted to ask you, like, what did you learn about in black history? Do you feel like you learned a lot more from your family as you were talking about? And then your pusher man um, following up on that. What did your curriculum look like? It sounded like you took a, a big, I guess, um, took it upon yourself to maybe educate your students. And I'd be curious, um, both of your perspectives on the education system and how it's doing or how it did when you were there. So if Juice wanted to take that one um, and then drop it over to your pusher. Yeah, so, oh, geez. Um, black history in school, was that was really interesting. So like, 
I think my first, the first time that a teacher ever tried to teach me about like go over like, the oh. civil rights movement, civil rights movement, was when I was in fifth grade. Uh, we went over, you know, the I Have a Dream speech. Went over a little bit about what Martin Luther King Jr. stood for, and uh, touched just a tad on Malcolm X, and talked about Rosa Parks and the bus boycott, and that was basically it. And at that point, my parents had already talked to me about um, Martin Luther King Jr. and then also Malcolm X, and. Like every every day for like that whole week or two weeks or wherever we along however long we are on we are on that unit, I'll keep asking questions. Oh, what about you know Malcolm? You know, what about Rosa Parks's uh, um, ideas outside of the the bus boycott? You know, what about other civil rights leaders? What was going on? You know, with say like the SNCC back in the day. You know, what what oh I, I, is this can't this isn't it? I know this isn't it. You know, can we please go back and talk about more of what's what what's in this unit? And it because I was in fifth grade, they never really like took me. So it was just like, oh, oh well, you know, we'll, we'll get to that eventually, or you know, mm -hmm. well, you know, that that stuff isn't that important, you know, or we have a lot of things to go over. We have time and all that. So I was suffice it to say, I was very fed up. Um, and that kind of like pervaded through middle and high school for me. Um, high school got a little bit better um, with my uh, my history teacher that I had in eleventh and twelfth grade. He did a he had a much more he made a much more concerted us about uh, what was going on during the civil rights movement, and then right after that in the late sixties, early seventies, um, and then the eighties with uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, but a lot of that, a lot of that class was still like me raising my hand questions to make sure that we cover certain things. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, like it gets tiring after a while. Like yeah. you keep doing it over and over. It's like I, I, I would understand. Like I, okay, I get it. Like this is one unit um, out of like five or six you have to teach in this semester. Um, you have a curriculum it's not entirely your fault for you know the quality of the education that we're getting right now but like something needs to change like mm -hmm. this should not be you should not you shouldn't have your hands tied as a teacher and what uh you feel is important to to teach because we would talk about like i would say after class like almost every day and we talk about like all the stuff that we were we discussing and he was he was a like a Really like a thirty-ish old white uh, white guy, and he knowledgeable about a lot of things that I was talking about, and we had some good conversations. But it's like I I really wish we had time and the us to carry these conversations into the classroom because I know it would benefit like me, him, as well as all the other students in the class, right? Um, so I mean. To, to sum it all up, my a lot of my again, my a lot of my education came from my family and came from my own research into doing mm -hmm. into you know whatever era that I wanted to that I had more interest in, and not very much of it came from my uh, my actual like formal schooling. If that makes sense. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. And that's what what kind of blows my mind is as I'm listening to you and you talking about raising your hand to kind of pull out additional information. Um, it's like, wow, even in the schoolroom, it kind of ended up falling back on you to put out the energy to to help push along that education. And I'm sorry that that's the case. Um, that's that's not helpful and it sounds like we've got a lot to improve which switches us over to your pusherman what was your curriculum like did you feel like it covered black history well um did you feel comfortable as a teacher going into it more it sounds like you you really pushed on that i think education starts first for me is just the teacher um my mom was a teacher and is a teacher for the past what, 40 years. My father is a teacher. So I think it started with this idea of 
seeing people who look like me at the head of the class. And that that's what I guess I, I look towards. Um, if you look at the book, um, why are all the kids, uh, why are all the black kids sit together in a cafeteria? Like that book is strong because you, you gravitate towards those first who look like you. So I remember it was, it wasn't really the curriculum, but more the teachers and those mm -hmm. teachers and the way they taught made me fight back against becoming a teacher. But then once I got older, I'm like, you know what? They were on to something like Miss Davis, um, Miss Calloway, Mr. Carter, and then my parents. So that's five. In my 12 years, I had five black teachers. And that's saying something. And then I, I think it got to my junior year when we read two books. We read uh, Ordinary People, which I told my, my English teacher, I'm like, I'm not reading this book. And so I took an F on the test, didn't read it. We had a week discussion. I just, I didn't say anything because I'm like, I'm not reading this book about, I believe is a, a family, a farm family in, I believe, Iowa. And I'm like, I'm good. I can't relate to it. And I'm not sure whether he picked up on that or whether he had it planned. But then the next book right after that was uh, Richard Wright's uh, Native Son. And I'm sitting there like, okay. So I'm reading the book and I'm the only, you know, black kid in my honors English class. And I'm loving it. Like he's, he's talking about Chicago. He's talking about, you know, tra traversing this idea of being black and then the narrative and just the fictional plot line. And I was, I lit up. And so that just taught me like, once you give a kid the food, the, the educational food to eat, they're going to eat forever. And so that's what made me realize like I need to be one in the classroom because as, as we know, black men in the classroom are few and far between and we make the most impact. And two, I need to make sure I include, of course, my own history, but try to tie in. Like I've taught, um, when I taught AP US history, I, I dove really deep in on the Stonewall riots and talked about that. Um, it, was, it was really big for me because I wanted to talk about Stonewall. I talked about yeah. um, Cesar Chavez. I talked about um, the Black Panthers. So I made sure that those contents and those topics that get glossed over, I wanted to deep dive. And the, the, the always they say, in the curriculum, there's not enough time and we have to gloss over stuff. I'm like, no, nah. like that, that's a cop out. Because mm -hmm. if you have a teacher who, who wants, like it's content and tests versus this idea of nurturing and fostering education. Mm -hmm. And I believe that once you see a kid light up, like I, I remember distinctly lighting up when I got Native Son and got that book, I was like, who is Richard Wright? And so after that, I'm like, let me, let me, you know, I read, I read Black Boy, I read all these, and because I wanted to know who he was, and that led me down the path of more Black authors, you know, Langston Hughes, all these, and I'm just like, I love it. So that's what happens now. It's like I want to give my kids this opportunity to say, make sure you know I'm going to help you look for your passion and tap into what you like, and that way I can bridge the gap. And I have, I'm planning my classroom. I'm with being the the one person that has that burden on my shoulder of making sure I touch on everything, but please believe I'm going to touch on black history. Please believe I'm going to make sure I touch on certain things. Uh, my last, I think last year I taught, no, two years ago is when um, the vanguard of the revolution came out about the Black Panthers. Once my AP class was done in May and we took the test, we watched that entire documentary. I'm like, we're watching it, we're going to discuss it because I, I mean, my, my, my uncle who passed away, um, my mother's brother, was a Black Panther in Chicago. And so I was like, I'm hearing this stuff and I like, I want to hear more about it because I, I want to understand what they went through and show my kids who are in Dubai, like, this is what it's about. And I think it's all about the teacher because too often people take education and teaching as a, uh, a job versus as a lifestyle. For me, it's a lifestyle. I've been 16 years in profession after coming from corporate America. My wife is 21, 22 plus years. My mom, my father, my aunt, her aunt, like we are a family of educators and this is a lifestyle for us. This is where I want to make sure that education has gotten me to where I can go anywhere in the world and travel and teach and just share my culture and my experience. That's beautiful. Can I just say that's so beautiful? I'm like getting a little emotional, actually, because I I kind of feel that um, my dad always told me you should be a teacher. You should be a teacher. You love teaching people things. And, you know, I ended up here on Twitch talking about gender studies. 
And I really feel that. I really feel that um, experience of like, it's a lifestyle, not a job. I can tell when I'm treating my stream as a job. I am disheartened. I am um, not covering the topics with the passion I would and therefore without the depth I would and I'm just trying to make it through and I feel like a lot of teachers are doing that at this point um and it you can you can feel it in the way they teach um for sure I feel like I could um I could tell my teachers who were there for teaching and who were there because they had to be um, and I think that's an incredibly, incredibly powerful. I think uh, that ties into a little bit on how we teach our teacher or not teach our teachers, excuse me, how we treat and pay our teachers. Um, I think that can add in some, some stressors there. But the other thing I wanted to mention about, um, you teaching on, uh, Stonewall and you teaching on these different, uh, areas that aren't always covered and aren't always are kind of glossed over and the excuses made for that, which I would say, you know, you'd know better than me, but uh, I think when you treat it like a job, you're doing the bare minimum a lot of the time because it's a job. And so you just hit the curriculum you need to and uh, get through that way. But I definitely feel you on that. Uh, when you got to read things that you related to and you cared about, suddenly, boom, your learning is like, you're there. And I felt similarly when I finally got to read a book about um, a queer couple. It was a classic. Uh, I'll have to see if I can find the name of it. Um, maybe the, maybe it was the color purple. I'm not sure, but um, I think that's that's really really powerful what you're getting at. Um, both with the, the treating it like a job as compared to a lifestyle. And then additionally, like the, the importance of really reaching out and hitting things that your students are going to relate to. With that being said, like when you're in Dubai, do you talk about history from the United States perspective and, or do any of these things play in? How how does that work? There's the foundational skills that they don't have as far as like constitution, um, understanding, you know, basic things. They know the generalness of it, but it's it's weird because I'm dealing with I have to start from scratch with some people. And that's hard because it's like you want to talk about, for example, I mean, I, I, I try to stay off the news too much in a day, but like you want to talk about NASCAR and Bubba Wallace and the Black Lives Matter and the news that was found in this garage. Okay, let's talk about it. The problem is we have to go back to why that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just a piece of rope, but why is that a problem? There's that there's history behind that. And out here, because Dubai has such a melting pot, like America says it's a melting pot. Nah, I've never met people from countries. I'm like, oh, that's a country. I know the country, but you're from there. Oh, okay didn't know that. So having that in mind and then these different perspectives is amazing. So it's, it's, it's trying to get them the root of the issue without wasting time. And it's, it's hard, but I try my best to do it because um, it's, it's needed. And they, they ask, like we have discussions where I, I've dedicated my class, like the first 15, 20 minutes of class is we just talk about current events. Mm. And I try my best to make sure I, I, I discuss with them what's happening. And I'm just, I'm, I'm sad that we weren't in school, like when the whole protest happened, because I'm just sitting there watching the TV and watching the news. And again, being on Twitch, like finding you on Twitch, because again, I find streamers, like I look for streamers and I was, you know, who's doing division, you know, everybody's doing last of us two right now. And so I then am looking, yeah. I saw your page and then I'm getting recommended of like, other pages where there's a, somebody who has all the live streams of like different protests in different cities. I'm like, yo, this, like, if only the, you know, our elders were alive to see this, they would be in awe of what's happening because it's taken over all 50 states, 13 plus countries, and it's amazing. And I just wish I was in class for my students to see that. And to, um, I think it was uh, NYC J Rod, if they're still here, their question was, are there protests in Dubai? No, nah, you can't do that out here. Like you can't. You, it's you'll get arrested 
for that. So it's really? for me, it's yeah, it's walking that thin line of I want to go in the streets and like, you know, protest, but it's a fine line between what you can and can't do because it's I mean, I'm a visitor and it's it's a it's a monarchy and I can't do anything about that. And I'm cool with that. So I try to wiggle my way, which is why, again, finding you on Twitch and like having these discussions, I'm finding my way to have discussions and protests, you know, online versus in the streets. Mm-hmm. So plus it's 150 degrees outside. So it's way too hot. And I don't, I don't care how black you are, 150 <laughs> degrees and I'm a male. Like, I don't care. I'm a it's about um, like the high 90s, low 100s in Texas right now. And I'm oh. trying to limit my outside activity as much as possible. So mm-hmm. no, I'm, I'm right there yeah. with you. I totally, I totally hear you on that for sure. And uh, I didn't realize that. I do know that um, I've been on Tinder a lot lately and I've been talking about the protests, of course. And I I ran into someone who was like, I would love to go to the protests with you, but I'm an immigrant and I've been advised to stay away. And that's something that is, that has to be so... For me, it would be difficult and frustrating and irritating. So I'm glad that we can have you on having this conversation. Um, And then also it is uh, with the coronavirus as well, getting out to the protests and the heat in Texas. um, There's always these uh, so many. It feels like so many barriers to having this conversation right now with coronavirus happening. Um, I'm sure that hits you doubly hard, as you were saying, your pusher man being so far away and then being texas with the heat too um a lot of those barriers and we are very fortunate to have this um this platform where we can continue those conversations and uh push forward so i'm very grateful for that for sure um definitely i wanted to dive into a little bit why why is it important to teach black history. You put a lot of effort into talking about, or, or even just current events. Why is that important? Why is it, Why do you go above and beyond as a teacher and make it a lifestyle like you do? The There's a proverb, um, an African proverb that says, uh, until the lions have historians, the tales of the hunt will be told by the hunter. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, very, very it's apt. funny because, yeah, I, I, I mean, with my hair, I've been growing my hair for like 15 years now. So since I started teaching, I grow, I was growing my hair, I've been locked. And so this idea of like internalizing, like the lion, internalizing the spirit of like being, being this, this king, because that's, that's what it was. We, like, we were once kings, we were once queens, we were once rulers until, you know, we got stripped from our land. I think I'm that. I think that's awesome. And I think that's important that we tell our own stories. I mean, it goes back to the whole Hollywood thing of like, who's telling our stories? Like the, I think it was what the green book, um, the whole backlash about that, like who's telling our stories? Like that's why Ava DuVernay, um, um, Kenya Barris, like all the, the creators who are creating these stories, that's important. And so I want to do my part as a creator, but in the classroom and, I believe as I've, I I got a BBA in marketing from Howard. So I know about advertising marketing. I know about propaganda. And once I got to history and I started to make the connection of, wait, there has been a global propaganda since the late 1800s in dispelling people from Africa and black people as not humans. And that propaganda has been perpetuated with Jim Crow, with segregation, with um, the caricatures during Jim Crow. And we're just now like trying to unpack and live this life. Like it needs to, that needs to be like dispelled. And the only way to, to dispel propaganda is by telling the truth and, and telling the truth from different perspectives. Like that's why like Juice's perspective, like being Jamaican, like there's a whole issue with that where I, I learned about it, especially with the islands in back during slavery, they had this thing called, uh, um, was it um, buck breaking? Where yep. if a if a so juice, I'm gonna let you talk about that one because yeah, that's I mean you that's it. that in a sense was amazing. So like once we have people, black people in spaces where they can effectively teach about this stuff, I think that's why it's important. Um, and 
I hate to say this, like, I think it's important that all history is taught. But for me, I'm going to teach black history. I'll try to teach everything else. But I think there's been so many culture vultures. There, there's been so many uh, erasists who have trying to, you know, wipe out our history. The idea of like, Did you I'm, just say I'm a stone. Yeah, I racist. love that. That's my, I, that's my toy. Yeah, that's my toy. That's, that's good. I like, I like that. Mm -hmm. I might use so, that. So, um, yeah, I we live a stone's throw away from Africa, from from the continent of Africa, and specifically Egypt. And this idea that I have a whole bunch of Egyptian students, and this idea of not understanding that Egypt was an empire of people of color, and the fact that people are like, oh, the Sphinx is amazing, but where's the Sphinx's nose? people don't realize there's a reason why they knocked the Sphinx's nose off. Like people don't understand like the history about the Sphinx had a wide nose, like Michael Jackson oh. in the eighties. And they knocked the nose off because they don't want any traces of this African culture. So if you look at all the tomb, they knock the nose off, they raid tomb. They're, they're raping our culture. Mm -hmm. And so it's time to like stop. And I, I, once I told like, I had Egyptian kids from Egypt and I told them this idea of like, yeah, the Sphinx, his nose was blown off because it represented a black person. They're like, no, I'm like, okay. If you, I mean, just take my word for it, but that's what you do. There's when you assimilate a culture, when you assimilate a people, the first thing you do is you, you make them forget about their own names, their own culture, and you teach them something new. So it's all washed away. That's why you think, look at the Greek gods. Those Greek gods are taken from Egyptian gods. And so this idea of like the, the actual mythology is Egypt but once you try to dismantle and assimilate, that's when it becomes a big issue of now people are seeing the truth and these stories are coming out. That's why, like, you have, you know, the idea of Black Wall Street in Tulsa. You have uh, Seneca Village, um, even in D.C., Georgetown. I didn't know about that. So I got to D.C. Like Georgetown was a, a predominantly affluent black neighborhood until they did the same. Not the same thing of Tulsa, but the same exact thing. They flipped it. And now Georgetown is thriving. It's, it's yuppie. So it's it's an idea of making sure that we dispel the lies because I'm sick of being lied to. I'm sick of being told what my history is by people who haven't lived my history. And that to me is the hardest part of just just being anybody of this idea of, again, the lions. Like until we can tell our story, don't don't speak for me. I'm good. I can I can say what I just say. Give me the platform to say it. And that's why I think it's it's so important that I'm able to do that and and help out with the the dissemination and breaking down the propaganda so mm. absolutely and i think that comes back a, a little bit to um juice box i'd like to hear any thoughts you had on the what your pusher man was referring to regarding jamaica i'm completely new to to that but i think we had a few questions in chat i wanted to pull up as well and ask chat um as as your pusher man is saying about people teaching history that they they have lived um and talking about how many black teachers we've had i know i have had i don't think i've had a single black teacher i cannot remember having a single black teacher um through my elementary middle school high school and then even through my college years um and I only think I had like maybe two or three people of color as a whole um, in, in my uh, teaching me from that time within that time. So that's mind blowing to me. But um, Sparta was asking when he says black history, does he mean um, for all black people, even in Africa or only for in the U.S.? Um, well, first of all, I'll touch a little bit on uh what you were referring to with buck, break with, uh, buck breaking in the mm -hmm. in the caribbean uh, that was so if for people who may not know uh slavery was not just trying to transatlantic slave trade went through more than just the u.s and europe it was also through the caribbean islands as well as the uh, well as well as south america and it's a part of central america as well i believe um and each nation had different uh, or slight differences in how they treated their slaves and how they conducted the uh, the uh, the business of of chattel slavery. For Jamaica, other islands, 
it was um I, I don't want to I hate drawing like quality comparisons, but there were some very uh there were some methods used to de to demoralize the slaves that wasn't as prevalent in the states. And one of that is buck breaking. And to uh essentially what what happened is the uh the slave masters or you know whoever was in this ordeal um would take the the men the black men in uh this the plantation and they would emasculate them demoralize them and their uh their family and whoever and all the slaves that were by, uh by raping them, by having non-consensual sex with them, and performing non-consensual acts uh, in front of their wives, aunts, grandmas, uh, uh, daughters, sons, and this was a a tactic you again used to demoralize him, but also to even the strong, strongest of you, or who we viewed as the strongest of you can be brought down to treat it as less than dirt. Mm -hmm. And yeah. when you when you see that happen to someone that you're, con you're all, also at the same time conditioned to believe should be the head of the household and should be the head of the family, um, that, that has a huge effect, huge negative effect on what and how you view yourself and the hope that you have for a better life, right? Yeah. And for a while, I mean, it was effective for many generations. Um, and well, that was, yeah, so that was just, that's that's that. Uh, I want also wanted to talk a little bit about um, where you're talking about the importance of teaching black history and uh, black literature. So you went over the, the non-fictional aspect of it pretty extensively, but I also wanted to take it from a different angle. So I believe it's also important for us to have stories of Black people told and taught through schools as well as through the mainstream media. So when I, what I mean by that is I want, I, I believe it is imperative for us to have shows like, I'm going to take it Back a little bit because this is like my 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 personal like love for um, cartoons and comics, right? Like I'm a huge I've been a comic book fan ever since I could read, and cartoon fan ever since I was watching cartoons. So like my earliest one of my earliest memories and what basically played a huge part in my uh, my uh, adolescent years was Static Shock. Um, yeah. That was yeah, that was the by Dwayne McDuffie. That was the first um, I saw a black lead in a cartoon in a uh, superhero show. And what made that so powerful for me to see was to see a kid that looked like me go through, you know, his shoes as Virgil Hawkins as a, a high school student, you know, going through things that high school students do. But then also what the writers did and what Dwayne McDuffie made sure that they um, he paid close attention to was how he interacted with the rest of the world. Like there are certain episodes where I guess they're, they're more after school special episodes where there was like a, you know, it wasn't necessarily canon, but the point of the show, the point of the episode was to have a message at the end. Um, and one of the episodes uh, that sits, that stood out to me the most uh, was when Virgil went to his best friend Richie's house for a uh, for us to sleep over. And for those who haven't seen the show, uh, Richie is, is white, um, and his father come, came home from work early that day. <coughs> Richie's Richie's father Virgil there, uh, and having that this like conversation over dinner, it basically showed Virgil that 
Richie's dad was a huge racist. Not only that, but he was a very hateful man. Mm. Um, you can see that that uh, the distraught with with uh, with Virgil and Richie when they were arguing about it afterwards, and that's not something that if you're not black or just the experience, right? Because that's something I went through several times throughout my childhood, and. At you know, at the end of the episode, Virgil's dad and and Richie's dad end up, you know, coming together to help Virgil and Richie, you know, save them from um, a supervillain that that was attacking them. But they have hard these hard conversations of, okay, you I know you don't like you may not like me because of the color of my skin, but we have a common goal that we should work towards, mm. and in doing this, you should see the humanity in me and you should see the humanity in my son mm. and the hate that you have is entirely misplaced and of course they couldn't go too deep into it because it was like a, you know it was a, it was a cartoon show or kid yeah. show but the, the point was made clear and seeing episodes like that it's very powerful not only that but these these kind of sh um sins are taught in comic books all the time. Like Static started out as uh, Milestone Comics in 1993. And until a couple years after the show aired, I went back and read, you know, through the, the, the comic book series. And they, Dwayne McDuffie goes so in depth about a wide variety of things to, to issues and topics that pertain to black people and in um, other uh, minorities as well. And, but you don't hear about that in the media. You don't hear about these, these stories and you don't see that representation. I actually didn't see it back when I was growing up. We're starting to see a little bit more with, with, um, with movies like Black Panther and as more uh, cartoons are coming out like, like Steven Universe Creek and you know, other cartoons like that that are showing us in a light that's not, you know, what we're used to seeing, you know, what we're stereotyped to be. And it's becoming more mainstream. And I feel like kids, while, while it's important to have studies on historical figures and historical events and time periods to know where we came from and um, the truth of what happened in the past and be able being able to learn from that and relate to what it is what's going on right now i also feel like there is great power in seeing yourself on a saturday morning cartoon being something that you may not see teachers in your school right or as you walk outside your neighborhood and you know or represented in your you know your local politics or local you know um, you know, elections or whatever. That is a vital part of, I believe, what should be part of this conversation of studying Black literature, Black stories, and Black history. And as someone that's, that is still best in comics and, and cartoons, that's something that I feel isn't talked about enough. And it's what I, like I specialize in, what my... Mm -hmm. My, my true, my like real passions lie. So I just wanted to, to, to point that out and bring the, bring that to the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we can tie that back into, um, just this whole system of the lack of representation through black history, through our teachers, who's teaching our history and who's, who's in our media, who we're seeing represented in our politics. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that ties in very well with this is not just a, we, we come here to talk about black history and what that means. And we see that it is a broader issue. We can zero in on this particular topic, but then we can zoom out a little bit and say, wow, this is an issue that we're seeing in, in many, many areas. And I think that's really good to acknowledge. So seeing those representations, um, whether that be representation in history or through uh, teachers, what does that mean for people? What does that mean for you personally, Juice Box and your Pusherman? 
I it's I mean it's big. So people always say you know representation matters, and then I we've been watching Netflix. So the idea of Netflix, they have I think when you log into Netflix, they have this idea. So I have a, a, a adults account and a kids account. So when you log into the adults account, it says representation matters, and it gives you like the top twenty five you know uh, black representation shows. And then on my kids account, it's the same thing. Shows I would never watch. And I think, I don't know how it's, what it's like to be constantly seen in a positive or negative or any light. Like, I'm not sure what that's like, because again, going back to the whole, the propaganda machine, where if we go back to, there's a great um, website. um, If your mods can put it in the um, chat, I believe it's um, Ferris dot edu slash jim crow and what it is is it's the museum from ferris state university and they have a jim crow museum of memorabilia where they show you the propaganda of what has been taught during jim crow south uh during segregation and this idea of you know what the caricatures were and how those were established during slavery carried over to reconstruction carried over to um jim crow era and are still there where it's very much um yeah fish put it in there it's very much this idea of they're pushing this mass media to negatively discount black voices and black people and so to have that and you're like i just want to see myself in a positive light i just want to see you know somebody who just looks like me and i know that's very superficial but in the sense of, you know, where does that work? And I believe, you know, that's, I mean, huge where last year, the show, the short story, um, Hair Love, it came out uh, j- j- January, December. And when it came out on from Sony, I, I showed it to my daughter, my son, but specifically my daughter, her hair is this big and she loves it. And this idea of showing her this short about black hair from her, do- her dad doing her hair and her dad has locks she was like, daddy, that's you. Like she identified clearly with the father who had locks with the little black girl who had curly hair. You don't see that anywhere else. And to have that representation, she, they watched it that first day it came out when it came and aired, we watched it seven times in a row, seven times back to back to back. And they loved it. Like, and then my son, he has, he has a nice fade. And then he has a little, um, the Patrick Mahomes look. So he he loved it as well because the idea of representing you know your hair because hair is hair is power and this is the reason why like you know boarding the slave ships they cut our hair because our hair speaks of our language and that's why like the idea of like locks and the idea of you know understanding and seeing people that look like me are are, are impactful and as you said I think you have to find where you fit be it comic books be it movies be it TV shows you just want to see somebody who looks like you from the face. And then they're going to have different stories being told. And that to me, again, when you're not in the mainstream and you're the, a subculture, it's very hard to express that because I don't know what it's like to have my face plastered everywhere and have my image of me plastered with good, bad, and different and all this spectrum of it. I just know this spectrum that's negative based on what they have taught of us in U.S. history. And so now it's just like, I want to see more of me. And the more I'm seeing, the more I'm loving these stories. I'm loving seeing these characters. And like, I'm not a black nerd, but seeing these stories about black nerds are great. You know, I might not be um, part of the uh, LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus a, a plus community, but knowing about Moonlight, I believe that's a movie, knowing about that, yeah. knowing that story is being told, knowing that there are um black transgender uh, women being killed just for their, their preference. To me, that's like, when do we have that? When is, when is our, their stories going to be told? And now it's coming out where they feel like they're being represented and they feel like they can stand up and be strong and be heard. And that's all about, we just want a voice. Like that's, that's why the black natural anthem, lift every voice and sing is so powerful. We just want a voice. We just want to say what we can say and live our life without the fear of oppression. And sadly to say, I feel living in three three countries now, America, Japan, and Dubai, I believe that I have never felt more free than being out of America. Anywhere else in the, in the world, I can say I can go there and I don't, it's not I'm black. I'm a person first. And then, oh, you're from America and you're black. Oh, let me hear. And I don't get that. Like in Japan, 
of course you get the idea they don't know what it's about i've gotten you know random japanese people coming up touching my hair um I, i've had to the point where you know the idea of little kids you know saying if i'm made of chocolate like i'm, I'm a chocolate man you know because i wear cocoa butter you know and this this notion of even that i will take that any day of the week over the 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 way i feel when i step foot in america because that i can deal with that i can't deal with the looks and being felt like i'm being followed and felt like i'm being you know accused of stuff because that that's not a way to live i just want to i want a voice i just want to be free and that's that's all we ask for we don't we don't want much and as as um What's her name in the video about uh, giving her dissertation, Kelly? I forgot her name, but the idea of we don't want revenge. Mm -hmm. We just want to be equal. That's it. That's mm -hmm. all we want is equality. And if at a certain point, if you don't give equality, we're going to say, you know what? F it. Let's revenge and let's do exactly what it does. But we're not there yet. And I don't want us to be there. Just give us equality. If you can't give us that, I don't know what's wrong with y'all. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's yeah, I think that's such a, a powerful quote. I I feel like um, that is something that a lot of marginalized groups can relate to. Like, we're only looking for equality and you are all acting like it's something else. And if we were looking for um, getting back at all the bullshit, it would be scary um, because it's a lot of bullshit. And... Um, I wanted to pull, uh, Sparta had a, another question really quick. Um, does your pusher man think there's a connection with the short history of 500 years the USA has with that racist problem the USA has faced all those years? I mean, Europeans came there and uh, mixed with natives. That's what I have. I'm not sure what you're getting at there, Sparta, but how the colonizers handled the natives, I think is definitely a concern. So maybe the problem has a connection with that era and the slavery after that. Sorry for my English if you can't understand me. So I think this goes into just how our history impacts the United States current position that you were just talking about, where it seems worse than in Dubai. It seems worse than in Japan, even though it's not people understanding uh, entirely your your black skin in Japan, for example, um, the the U.S. seems a lot worse. Do you think it has to do with that history? That's, I mean, Sparta hit it on the head. I, I've, I'm trying to, and I've been trying to for the longest. I, I use, when I taught world history, and I still do teach world history, but the idea of if you think of world history and the world as a high school, and every country is an individual person, and you understand the alliances, and you understand how you know wars are starting, how friends fall out. If you pay, take that, the next step I'm trying to find a way to do that is to build the idea of age. Age is definitely a big thing because if you look at countries who are more um, elder in their foundation, they recognize this idea of checking stuff from the beginning. And I think America is in this like a teenage ish of still not realizing who they are. And I'll go back to, you know, if Alcoholics Anonymous or any support group, everybody knows the first step. Like the first step of recovery is to admit you have a problem and that you don't have control. And this thing is, is, is overthrowing your life. That's what racism has done. Racism is not something we can control. It is something that's been inputted and it's overthrowing America's life, but they have yet, America as a government body has yet to fully recognize that. Yes, there are individuals, and I love that individuals are actually stepping up and saying, there are institutions who are saying it. Some I look at a little side-eyed because they're probably doing it for profit, but you know, there's a first step to everything. But the idea of they're taking that first step to admitting there's a problem, that's when you grow. That's literally when you go to the next step of trying to treat the problem. And America has, has yet, government has yet to admit there's a problem. When you look at like uh, Germany, and I, I've been to Germany, we went with the family, we went for uh, the Pokemon Go Fest last summer. So we went to Germany. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, that's, I, have to, I have to shout out that. We went to Germany. I didn't do much touring because we were just in, in the Pokemon Fest. But <laughs> I would, I, I wonder 
does Germany have any massive plots of land that have statues to Nazi soldiers? Because if they do, then there's a bigger problem. But I would say they might have a few and far between. But the fact that America has so many Confederate soldiers, so many Confederate troops, and they're living this heritage and culture of that's my heritage of, but y'all lost. Like you, you, you're representing a losing side. And you want to say the South shall rise again? Like that's me is not about history. That's some bigoted type. You need to grow up and realize we ain't going back to that. And that's where it gets frustrating where how many you know, of these, I mean, even in London, they're overthrowing, you know, um, colonizers. How many statues of uh, Pelosi said to have a rotunda of Confederate soldier statues? Really? Like I've lived in DC, I never saw them because I just didn't go there, but I don't have homage and tribute to people who actually protested the government, formed their own country, fought a war and lost. I, I don't, I, I, if that's the case, you know what? I want the Warriors won. They were down, they were up 3 1 and lost to the Cavs. No, the Warriors won. I want that, I want that championship ring because they won. Or in fact, Jordan didn't retire in those two years, he also won because who celebrates losers? That's just, that's my opinion. And again, I, if I'm getting too passionate, that's just how I feel. I just don't, I don't understand that, that mentality. No, yeah. I, um, I, this is, I'm, thank you, Disciples, is going into this. And this is one of the areas I actually looked into as well. And I was reading an article on how in Germany, no, they educate very clearly on what happened. And you visit memorials to those lost. And I think that's that's exactly what you're saying is so on point. Um, just, just boosting that is like, we don't acknowledge the problem. We're not acknowledging the problem. And this is an exciting time though I'm sure an exhausting time for, for everyone as well, because it's like these conversations are coming up. Finally, these conversations are coming up and people are, well, I want to say finally, but we've had these conversations over and over and over, like in 2015, and now we're in 2020 and we're having it again, but it's been more sustained and that's sure. good, but I am sure it's exhausting for sure. But, um, it seems like Germany handled their problem maybe because they were more forced to by the rest of the world um, in in actually handling what they did to people. Whereas now we have this losing side and we we allow them to go through, just as you said, um, claiming its heritage. Heritage to, to what? To own people and to profit off of their slavery and their incredible mistreatment? Like... What is wrong with you? Um, I think that's a, a really good and, and powerful point, that contrast of how Germany has handled it as compared to the United States, where we still have those memorials because of the United uh, Daughters of the Confederacy putting them, fighting them to put them up and everything, as compared to Nazi, or excuse me, as compared to Germany and how they handled the Nazis, so dramatically different. Um, I think it's it's mortifying um, and we're uh, hopefully we can move forward and have that conversation without exhausting every black person that ever existed. Like, God damn. Uh, yeah. So do you have um, any like in Dubai? What? You can't be protesting, but are you talking to your students about these things? Oh, definitely. Um, and that's where the classroom is the safe space where, um, so I, I have my, my classroom, uh, my teaching philosophy is, is Harkness Method, which is based out of uh, Extra Academy. So I created five, six years ago, um, my website and my channel, The Art of Harkness. So I'm now trying to cross over. And that's why, again, finding you on Twitch was amazing. I want to start using my channel, The Art of Harkness, that I'm streaming on now. And actually, when I have discussions, live stream my discussions with my students 
because that's the one place where it's like hands off as long as you are meeting the content and being respectful of everything. We had a discussion two weeks ago uh, that just came out of the air um, with my freshmen and they, we were talking about their project and yada, yada. And then next thing you know, it was a quiet time. And I said, you know, you guys are, it was a Zoom call. You guys are free to leave if you want to. And all our Zoom calls are recorded. And one soon asked a question. And then for 45 minutes, we just talked about it. And what I do is I don't talk. I just let them talk and let them express their ideas and let them be uh, like Socratic with it and mm -hmm. allow them to be wrong, and correct each other where I don't feel like I want to give them the knowledge. And they'll ask me, Mr. Murray, well, what do you think? I'm like, well, it's not really about what I think. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And so I push it back on them and they, they'll go for 45 minutes just talking amongst themselves. And I find that in the classroom, I'm able to discuss pretty much everything as long as I'm making sure I'm as not diplomatic, but as you know, careful going by guidelines of the rules out here. And it's, it's, allowing me to do so where if i taught math i couldn't do it if i taught science i couldn't do it because i teach history i'm able to say hey well we were talking about social justice therefore let's discuss what is happening in america with social justice and then tie in what's happening in yemen with the idea of social justice and then what's happening with and i can just go down the rabbit hole and the kids are right there with me and i, I love i love that, that avenue to have doing that yeah absolutely um, and that's something I always loved about my women's studies courses is that focus on the the students having conversation and really um, letting them go where where they are and maybe directing a little bit. I think students learn very, very well that way. Um, and that's something we try to mimic a little bit here in our stream even is we learn from each other. We grow together. It's not just me up here lecturing you. I think that's such a such an incredibly powerful thing. I, I wanna aim this question from Sparta at both of you. Um, is there any progress historically in the way black people are treated there? I mean, is it slightly better now from let's say 70 to 100 years? Is there any progress? What are, what are your thoughts around progress racially in the United States? Go ahead, Jewish, you got that one. So, I feel like when we look at how how society has progressed through you know throughout history, we need to first acknowledge the great amount of work that's been put in by progressive figures as well as progressive movements, right? And be able to recognize the work that's been done throughout those years. But at the same time, we also and I feel like this is something that's lost in the conversation oftentimes is America has this knack of finding different ways to adapt to new forms of racism, of, of, of institutionalized racism. Right. Um, so from, for example, slavery, chattel slavery, when that was abolished, turned to the black codes, just turned into the prison system, right? And that was just, and that which is essentially just slavery by another, and in some ways was even more effective because you get the the degradation of being black, it was literal second class citizen to being a number another form of a second class citizen, which is a criminal, right? Mm -hmm. So you get even less sympathy from people, unless uh, were by white moderates and white liberals to help you out, right? And then fast forward 100 years later, the Civil Rights Movement, the Voting Rights Act, as soon as, you know, we were made a law, you know, the same as, um, as uh, you know, other, you know, as white people, essentially, then they introduced uh, the war on drugs into our communities. You know, trying to get us again back into the prison system as the same thing that they were doing during um, during the civil rights movement. We did for people for um, for protesting, and we're seeing that right now, right? So I feel like 
progress has been made. It's at times it's it's waxed and waned, gone from steady to stagnant over the years. I think we've come a long way from where we were, say, seventy years ago. Um, but I feel like a lot of the same sentiments, a lot of the same fears that white people have about progress, have been changed much since since those times. I feel like a lot of things, especially like white liberal, how white liberals tend to view uh, racial progress, is, is very superficial and relies more on an aesthetic. Uh, or term, uh, relies more on an aesthetic terms of tokenization as opposed to uh, genuine, uh, genuine progress and genuine equality and genuine equity for for black and, and white people. And I feel like that's again that's something that's been that's pervaded through the years. And we won't. It's one of the biggest obstacles to progress that to. In our current day, I feel like that 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 more than possibly more than anything else needs to be addressed. I think I've never used this metaphor, so I'm gonna try it right now to see if it makes sense. Um, to Sparta's point about progress, and I, I agree with you, there has been progress. So think of it like this: I mean, there's been plenty of metaphors. I'm gonna use my own metaphor because it makes sense to me. Um, hmm. As a father of twins. If I'm, especially when they were little, if I'm eating and I'm hungry, I get up and I eat and they look at me like, you going to feed me? And so for the time being, I'm like, okay, here is a carrot. Take the carrot. You good? Okay, good. And that carrot should last for a good, maybe three, four, five hours. But of course they're still hungry. And once you give them a taste of like this idea of what food is, what substance is, what, what freedom is, they want more. And so I think that that same mentality has been going on where black people have started from like literally not eating. Like we know what freedom is because we've seen it. And now like freedom, equality, and then solely but surely, okay, okay, here, take, take this, take this law. And, and this law should, you know, appease you guys for a good 20, 30 years. And then once that law is, we've run its course. No, we want more. Okay. Uh, take affirmative action. You can, you can have that. But then there's also <clears throat> stuff behind the scenes, whereas, as you said, you know, I go to the thing of after the Civil War, when you had this this idea of reconstruction and the idea of industrial revolution in the late 1800s and the idea of immigrants coming in and the KKK being founded and the the idea of nationalism. The KKK members, the reason why they wore sheets over their head was to protect their identity. They were teachers they were lawyers. They were doctors. They were all these people. The KKK hasn't gone anywhere. These same people who were KKK members had children and those children had children and those children are now CEOs. Those children now are police officers. And you say there's no such thing as systematic racism. No, it is when you you systematically put people in power and say, you run this and make sure you control this avenue. And that's what the KKK mm -hmm. did. And again, they don't need to march in the streets. Those who do, they can. Yeah. But there are people who don't need to march because they're actually at boardrooms and they don't have to wear sheets because they're making policies to prevent anybody who's not you know, white from getting in the building. And so this idea of progression, yes, America has progressed, period. America is not where it should have been and what it stated in its constitution, being a person who has taught the constitution in AP US history for eight years, it's not where it should be. Where if you say all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, the most mm -hmm. of all is life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. People don't realize pursuit of happiness is not a destination, it's a journey. I want the ability to pursue what makes me happy. And there are by people in this country, but we're talking about black people now, who cannot pursue what they want to be happy is be because the powers that be are oppressing them. It's, it's an invisible hand. And we have to realize until those are addressed and that layer of like stuff is being pulled back, we can't progress fully. There has been some progression, mm -hmm. but as you look at your PS4 screen, when you're loading a game that you've downloaded, that bar is this long, you're right here. 
can you give me the full progression, please, so I can play my game and be free? Yeah. Thank Good. you both. Thank you both for your perspective. I agree wholeheartedly with that. Thank you both for your perspectives on that. I really appreciate it. Um, I know I hear a lot of people say, well, we had Barack Obama in office, you know, he held the highest office in the in the world. And I say one black man was president. And you think that we have full equality for the races. I think that you are a little bit lost. <laughs> um, we have so much more. It's not just getting a, a black person in one really high office that's going to undo racism. Um, that's not how it works. It is a progression. And I think that's that's a really powerful point. Um, I wanted to speak to some resources. Uh, well, first off, we did have a raid and I want to, it's such a perfect raid. Welcome in Step Back History. We covered one of your videos, I believe yesterday um, on scientific racism. Thank you so much for your content focused on history. Today, we're focusing on um, black history and what it has to do with racism and combating racism and just talking about history in general. So we're glad to have you here. Welcome on in. Um, Step Back History is a resource you can go to. But if you were listening to Juice talk about how we've seen it go from slavery to the black codes to um, criminal criminal basically slavery sla the enslavement of our criminals you can watch 13th on netflix that was helpful to me um in educating myself but do either of you have like additional areas that you would recommend people to learn a, a little bit about black history and some of these issues based in the states i think that's probably my favorite one um i go to my favorite by far is a book by Isabella Wilkerson called The Warmth of Other Suns. The what? It came out in 2010. The Warmth of Other Suns. It came out in 2010. And the day it came out, I started reading it and I taught it to my AP class and I've been teaching it since then. It is a book about the Great Migration and it tells a story of three different um, black people from Florida, Louisiana and Mississippi and their journey from where they were to leave um, the Jim Crow South and go to their different directions. One went to New York, uh, one went to Chicago and one went to Cali. And the book is, I mean, it's thick. I can do, I, I have the book. It's in my suitcase in the hallway. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, when it comes to understanding the idea of the pain that, you know, people have gone through, like, my grandmother is from Mississippi. So, and I mean, she passed away um, uh, last year. And I, I remember just my mother talking about, you know, going to Mississippi and being like worried about going to Mississippi when she was young and hearing a story about like their journeys and like what they had to deal with. That book is a great way to start because not only does she follow the three stories, but she gives historical context to what Ooh. happened. Like she gives, she talks about Rosewood. She talks about um, what happened with Emmett Till. Like she discusses everything and it's historical um, nonfiction. It's a biography. And she has, she's went through and interviewed all three families along with other people. And it took her, I think five years to write. And it's, wow. I mean, hands down, it's a great book. I have five copies. One copy is in shatters because of highlighting and marking and paging and folding and discussing and ripping and bending. And I have one that's in pristine condition that I don't touch, but it's a great book. And I, I actually, I, I love the book. It's amazing. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Um, my recommendation, I'll start with, I'll, I'll put, I'll put two out there. So the first one is, is um, white rage by Carol, Dr. Carol Anderson. That, Get that in a paper bag as well as an audiobook. Therein, she goes through and breaks down the history of of Ameri of basically white America's retaliation to us in, in throughout the United States from or through from uh, chattels trying to times of the uh, transatlantic slave trade all the way up to administration, and she. she 
focus is in on the progress that was being pushed and the ways in which full levels of government and uh, it was fought against either in, in subtle and not so subtle, very more direct ways. Um, she will go through everything from uh, she talks about the black codes, of course. She will go more into she goes even she goes more into um, say like voting rights right after the seventies and how the um, how local governments would restrict vote voter access to minority communities through ways that were technically legal, but, you know, through, and, you know, for analysis, you find are very, um, very underhanded, but worked at the time. And that really, I learned quite a few things from, from that, even from, cause I read this like three years ago and it's such a great resource for understanding the uh, the sheer amount of pushback and the 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 want for for uh, for the government to have a divide between black people and poor white people or more or middle class white people to instill in both of us that there is in common between us and that if black people throughout history get more rights and more perhaps equal access to resources as these as white people that in turn does not equal does not mean progress it means a regress from the social status of so they thought that things the things were going to get worse essentially in other words they thought that things were going to get worse for them as things got better for us and they were able to use these nice these people to essentially work for, for them in a lot of ways right militia from you know the 1800s and early 1900s to you know more uh institute uh retaliation that we see as your person man uh mentioned in having a, a kkk members within the system of you know, law enforcement law you know just the justice system uh you know judiciary positions legislative positions etc cetera, etc cetera. um so yeah definitely check that out white rage by carol anderson and more uh personal to me and something that i it's probably the it's actually the most recent book that i finished was um martin luther martin luther king's chaos where do we go from here chaos is community which is the last book that he wrote months before he was assassinated in, in 1968 um therein he and he wrote he wrote this in, while he was in um spending time in jamaica away from the, the state um, he there and he goes into to, um as just like carol anderson going through like the history of progress throughout the last couple hundred years and he each chapter he'll touch on different subjects that are most uh pertinent to what's going on you know in the late 60s post food and voting rights act um he talks about the black the the up and coming he talks about you know the role of white liberals and white america in integration and their reactions to it and he talks about the and i believe this is where people were truly starting to um people like all over were starting to like diverge away from or see him as somebody that is more than just like the happy you know cool sing let's all come together and be equal you know with love you know love thy neighbor that kind of side of martin the king jr and went to more towards the the philosophy of we need to tackle our issues through through capitalism or by tackling capitalism we're able to address the social inequalities between uh, uh people all people in the uh and speaking more towards you know decrying capitalism uh uh methods of keeping people you know impoverished and and um we are keeping a real 
resource, valuable resources that they need to live and to be educated from their communities. And that really, I, I, I knew he, would, he had touched, he had talked about that in his last months before he was killed. But I didn't know a lot of these things were that he was so like, like at the time he was considered radical or he, his views would be considered radical. And, you know, in our community, we, I feel like a lot of people would, or most, if not everybody would be able to better uh, with what he was talking about and better right. understand his perspective if they were able to, to know like exactly where he stood and have a greater of what he stood for, what he was fighting for and why he was killed. So I will, again, I'll reiterate this book to me more than his other book showed me a side of Martin Luther King Jr. I feel like more people need to see and more people to need to recognize as the true and most uh, progressive uh, that we've that we know and that we that we're able to to recognize. So yeah, White Rage by Carol Anderson and Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos of the Community by Martin Luther King Jr. is what I'll, I'll put out there. Thank you both. I really, really appreciate that. Um, and so we're talking a little bit about areas that where resources that we could get more information on black history. Um, we've talked about about why representation is important, why looking at our history is important. But I want to ask you, like, why do you think what do you think is the damage of not teaching black history in the United States? Um, if you want, me that's to an interesting question. No, it's just I've I've. It's a it's weird because. I mean, we're seeing the damage kind of like mm -hmm. there's it's like trying to um, be prophetic and trying to um, foreshadow what's going to happen. But we've seen the damage. You'll have people who just don't know who they are and, and the idea of not knowing who you are. And it, it goes back to this notion of being in Dubai where it's it's a gift and a curse where it's not even the education system, but the idea of being black in Dubai, and I don't turn, use the term African-American because we don't, I don't, because I don't really feel like I can represent and feel like I'm from Africa or I'm from America. I'm just black. Like that's, that's, and that's a whole different conversation. But this idea of being out here, people are like, oh, you're from America. And I'm like, yeah, but, oh, but you're, you know, you're American. Yeah. And it, it gets interesting because then I, I talk to, you know, people from Cameroon, uh, Ethiopia, Nigeria, uh, Ghana, Gambia, everywhere. And they can trace back their family to where they're from. Whereas me, I'm like, yeah, I know my grandmother and I know I know her grandmother was Choctaw Indian. And I don't I can't I stop. I, I can only go back three generations. Mm. And for me that's that that's that's hurtful where i don't know where i'm from I, I mean i know i have melanin in my skin and i know you know that can be traced to certain places but i don't have you know a, a place so i can call really home and that's why as you said for me like the comic but then seeing the movie black panther like I, critics aside for me personally like my, my my twins will ask so daddy like is wakanda real and i'm like Wakanda was real, but the name wasn't Wakanda. Mm -hmm. Like you think about all the places, you think about the Gold Coast in Sierra Leone, you think about the oil, you think about the diamonds, you think about the the um the carbon that makes our iPhones. Like that's from the continent of Africa. And those places, if they knew how to use those resources, could have been kingdoms and they were Wakandas, but because they were stripped and raped of their culture, they lost that. So I would tell them, like, yeah. It's real. And this idea of I really feel a, a kindred to like like into Jaka and, and Jordan uh, Michael B. Jordan's role, because there's this notion that goes way back, a 
called the Lost Tribe, where he literally embodied this idea. He was in Oakland. He knew where he was from, but he felt alienated from that place. And he also felt alienated from America. So he was just like this, this wandering tribe. Whereas for me, and I, I can't speak about myself as a black person, being black from America, I feel like that lost tribe. I don't feel at home in America. I don't feel at home in Africa. But anywhere I go, I set my head. I can feel at home. I can I can be cool. Like I can I can live in Dubai my whole life. I can live in Japan my whole life. I can live anywhere. But I don't really have a place to call home. And that is what the 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 struggle he was dealing with. And at the very end, like I I saw Black Panther because I was pushing this whole thing in Dubai of like early screening. I actually saw Black Panther one of I think 50 people in the world who saw Black Panther two weeks before it came out. So I was on that list of like seeing it first. And I saw it again when I had a real estate party. And I saw it again. So I've seen Black Panther four times in the first week it came out. And the first time I saw it, like when he gave his last speech at the very end, like I'm crying, like like crying like Lion King um, Mufasa died crying, <laughs> you know, to the point like that's, that's how it felt because I'm like, he is like people who are in the audience who don't understand this, this pain, he is talking the language I've known for my whole life. Mm -hmm. And that to me was so powerful. And that's why I'm like, we need to know our stories. Everybody needs to know their stories, of course. But in this moment right now, we need to know black history because it's important because there's a group of people who, I mean, you think about um, Native Americans, they, they, for all intents and purposes, they got their reparations of like, land and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you think about the Japanese internment camps, they got their reparations. You think about people who have, whose America has wronged, they have gotten their reparations. The only people who have not gotten reparations is black folks. And I'm just like, I don't want a check, but just tell me where I'm from so I can feel like I understand who I am so I can move forward and then tell my children their story and let them tell the story because that's what we're missing. And that's where I feel like America will do right by people they want to do right by. But then uh, it goes back to the first step of recovery. They are not going to admit that racism was a problem. They are not going to admit that because it's not in their best interest. And I have to be OK with that. But I'm going to teach it. And I think it's important to teach it because it's important that people know not the real history, but know what is being taught, what is being lied about, and then what is um, being the truth. And that's just how I think as educators, we have to put our foot in the sand of like, I'm not going to whitewash the textbook. I'm going to make sure I teach both sides and allow the students to decide what they believe in. And mm -hmm. that's pretty much like, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm Morpheus. Like, do you want the red pill or do you want the blue pill? Okay. Because either way, I'm going to give you the blue pill. No, I'm going to give you the red pill to stop the matrix, but you're going to take it by force or by choice. And I need to show you like, this is what it's about. Mm -hmm. I hope I got my pills right. I don't, I don't remember. It's been a while. <laughs> That's totally right. fair. Um, something I want to catch Juice, Juice Box's opinion on this as well. And I have my own thoughts from a, a considerably different perspective. But um, I want to make sure that we hit the point of um, absolutely. I think we've acknowledged to some extent the issues uh, regarding natives. But I think there is so, so much more that we have to do there. Um I'll, I'll actually, yeah, um, uh, I don't, I can't speak very clearly on this personally. I am still um, lacking on indigenous rights considerably, um, but uh, I'll, I'll grab something from 98 in our chat. Native people didn't really get their reparations, sadly. Speaking as a black person, America does its damnedest to make people think that native people got reparations while a majority of them still, still don't have drinking water. And um I don't think we need to dive into this topic very heavily in this moment. We should. Um, I would love to, in the future, have a panel focusing on indigenous issues. There are things that I learn every time it comes up. Um, but yeah, I, I don't want that to take away from your point where we just haven't even, we have done nothing um, regarding reparations. And the moment, from my understanding, the moment we did consider giving reparations to slaves that were coming out of slavery, it got taken back because it pissed people off. So what the fuck? Um, what the fuck? Uh, 
but yeah thank you chat for for mentioning that and uh i didn't want to speak over your point your pusherman but we definitely want to be sure that we're uh acknowledging that while it might have been a start eh, or acknowledged a, a little more or or differently because we're lacking that acknowledgement in any sense for the black community um there's definitely still significant significant issues but uh juice what what were your thoughts on the topic of what damage it does um by the way i before we move on to juice i wanted to say your pusherman thank you because i um when when there was hesitation on both of you or not hesitation but maybe a moment of thinking I had my own answer, but it's incredible to hear your perspective. It's it's obviously so different from mine. Um, I could speak to the damage it does to, if you could categorize it as damage, but the damage it does to white people's understanding and therefore for me um, lacking in black, well, I'll get into it, um, but it's so, I think it's so important to hear your perspective on how it affects black communities or how it has affected you uh personally so thank you so much for sharing that and juice if you want to add on to your experience the damage you feel it does to you i'd love to hear that sure sure so you brought up a. Uh, I'll, I'll i'll tackle this on my on uh so you brought up a good point um, when you mentioned the push for reparations that Tanasi Coates uh, and um, other activists had been uh, pushing for uh, very recently, and the amount of backlash that got. And what was interesting to me, um, hearing the a lot of the like the Republican, largely Republican senators and representatives' criticism of the bill was that or a common theme I found was that they refused to acknowledge that, or they acknowledged that there were atrocities committed. What, what they failed to recognize was that the rippling effect that, they ha that these uh, atrocities and these events have had on the black community throughout history. And they deny that it, it is in, uh, that there is issue these events currently. And I feel like, and you are pushing, man, you, push on, you touched on this earlier, but America has yet again, yet to completely recognize and come to terms with the events that had transpired in the past and are transpiring now and refusal to acknowledge the, um, the effects that they're having on, again, on the black community. And when... When you grow up in an environment, what you're being told and what you're being taught in your about yourself and people who look like you is this watered down, whitewashed version of and and many events and people are just completely omitted. You you grew up in this 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 mentality of America, but I'm sure it's prevalent in other other countries as well, um, where everything that happened to you was at the behest of white, right? Lincoln can free the slaves. We have him to, 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 to thank for that. You know, um, the union, you know, fought, for, fought so that the so that slavery could be abolished. Union was they as is often taught, largely composed of of white northerners and white abolitionists. That's not entirely true. There are plenty of black soldiers that also fought for the Union and black soldiers that fought for the Confederacy forced to do that because they had they they had no choice. Mm -hmm. Right. But these 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 but essentially we're given this idea that black people throughout history have had a small part to pay or a small part to play in the progress that's been made socially and, and, and economically 
Martin Luther King Jr., as they often teach in schools, is somebody that wanted to everybody to come together and peacefully and, and white people would march would a threat would be attracted by that march with him and then you know lbg lb you know came together with him and they signed the voting rights act and that was that and ultimately it was martin Luther king jr's benevolence that pushed people to see the humanity and to see the wrongdoing in the wrong and what they've been how they've been treating black people but again white people are the ones centered in this in this uh in the in these in these historical teachings so when you don't paint this when, or when you don't get the whole picture of what's been what progress has looked like when you don't have the literal images of the people that have con greatly contributed to the pro over the years you as a kid you kind of you grew up with this, and I'm speaking from experience and experience from other people that I've known, that I know, um, with sort of like this, this feeling of I can't do much on my own. People, the 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 conditions in my community aren't my fault but there's not much I can do about it. I have to rely on white elites and white officials to get things done, for things to change. There's not much I can do on a personal level or much organizing that I'm able to do because any progress that has been made has been largely by white people coming together or white people you know, coming together as, you know, as a country or in Congress or in or wherever, uh, legislative position, judiciary positions, et cetera, et cetera, to come in and essentially see that there's a problem and do everything in the power to fix it. So again, this is why I, I try to push for people to get the whole picture of, of our civil rights leaders and civil rights movements so that they can understand that it was not that it was like many individuals that have not been given the recognition that they deserve and a lot of the progress not just for black people but for you know women's liberation um as well as uh minority communities stonewall great example has been largely because of people that they purposefully do not teach us in public schools and purposely don't don't show us in movies and in TV shows and you know mainstream media you know et cetera et cetera and we need to recognize that if we are going to move forward if we are going to make progress and we are going to be able to get the hope and the vigor to go out and make change for ourselves first we have to recognize that this that if whatever we do ones that have tried it. Regardless of whether it's worked or not, there has been concerted effort to, you know, people and to, to create change from the ground up. And as citizens, as people, you know, Joe's, but as people who don't have the systemic power to enact change on an institutional level, per se, we have power, hands, our own communities as members of our you know of our media vicinity or our communities or whatever to bring about change in our own ways to fight for change in our own ways and i feel like we're starting to get there from all the protests and demonstrations that have been going on um in all major cities throughout the u.s um but i would like to emphasize that um to, to, to answer your question more uh, directly that it's done great damage to the psyche of people growing up and the mentality mm -hmm. of us um, can be basically convincing us that we can't, we have to wait around because we don't have power to change our own destinies and to change the destinies of the people in our communities. And that is one of the greatest tools I feel like that 
the government institutional levels has succeeded in over the years of convincing black people and minorities uh, as well, and as well as uh, white people as well that change can only come through if white people allow it mm. and right. that's that's a dangerous lesson very very dangerous lesson that's been instilled so, in us. like you said dangerous like that's i was as you were talking like that's what came to my mind like this is it's, for us we know why but for everyone else like there's a danger like the idea of caution danger and you hit it with your last points of there's ground movements and there's there's people on the ground um trying to break the ground and move up and at the same time there hasn't been that in the terms of reaganomics that trickle down to reach down and i think the biggest danger is this uh the talking point um of conservatives of this idea of why don't you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and mm-hmm. what's interesting about that quote is like it puts present day as the only thing that exists right now without taking into account what has happened before because Mm -hmm. to say that oh just pull yourself out of your bootstraps that is dangerous because you're not acknowledging what happened in the past not to mention there are literally people black people black youth who don't have bootstraps to begin with because they don't have boots because of income and housing disparities because of the new jim crow because of the 13th amendment because there's no fathers there's that but then oh just go to this good school and get out educationally okay great let's take my city for example on the south side of chicago um back in 20 2014 15 I, my years off they closed 53 schools on the south and west side and those schools were in predominantly black and brown neighborhoods so you close neighborhood schools and you tell them, OK, go to this another school that's across gang lines, across territory lines. Well, I wanted education to get out, but I got to cross the street where literally there are two rival gangs and I might not make it to school. So how can I pull myself with my bootstraps when there's other things that are, are that you're not acknowledging that ha- that have been happening? The idea of there are kids who are at school and literally who go to school just to have lunch. There are kids who just go to school to have a safe place to be. There are kids who might be homeless and go to school just to have a, a, a roof over their head. You know, and like once those things have been addressed, yeah, then we can pull ourselves by our bootstraps. But when people say that, like they don't understand the history. And that to me, as, as you said, that is dangerous where once not just us as black people, once everybody knows the history, that's when we can actually say, let's acknowledge this and go tick by tick to address what has been happening so that we can try to rectify it together and not me from the ground up saying, how do I combat institutionalized racism or you from the top down? It needs to be a concerted effort on both parts. And we're in times where now it seems like it's happening. Um, and it, it, it's, it's interesting to see what's going to come forth. And I just, I I'm I'm loving this right now. And with the election coming up, like I'm looking forward to going back and teaching like the constitution and election, because this is now going to be very interesting to talk about what's going to happen. I will hold my opinion about voting and how that because I don't vote for a reason. And I I've seen the history behind it. And I just, that's a whole different conversation, but it's interesting to see this process going forward. Mm. Mm. Thank you both. I feel like um, I got a lot of insight from you talking about the disempowerment. It seems like disempowerment is a large part of that, the disempowerment, the removal of power um, by not knowing your own history. Um, And I think that is the core issue that we would look at. Um, And thank you so, so much for speaking on that. Uh, in a way that I just, from an from a perspective, I personally don't have, and I haven't heard. I really sincerely appreciate that. Um, I think to those of us who don't have that experience, I want to give a side note to say that I think this affects racial relations and us coming together to fight other issues on top of racism because that's that's 
the core thing we're working on here is is the racism but then how that intersects with all of our other issues is i think that it inflames racism for us as white people to not know black history and how black liberation has happened because we can be more complicit in upholding this this racism and upholding these ideas that they're speaking to by not understanding that black people have and continue to be held down by this system. Uh, me not knowing that helps me dig into like ignoring racial issues by just saying, oh, well, you know, someone else said it's because black people aren't pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. And I don't know the historical context if I don't learn it. It does damage to racial relations from the white perspective if we are left ignorant and left to believe these lies that black people um, are just being lazy or it's their culture or all of these other misinformation uh, this misinformation that's kind of directed our way it's really damaging um in in that sense not nearly as damaging as what they're speaking to but we are not as suited to be there for our black comrades if we don't know these things if we aren't there to understand not just not just that racism exists but how we can combat that with them how we can stand there with them and, and boost their voices so thank you both so sincerely for coming and sharing your perspectives and um talking on this issue i appreciate it so much absolutely and yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for having me yeah if <laughs> either of you want to shout out where we can find you if you do any work online that you would like to shout out um i would love to know i'm sure our chat would love to know as well um so take it away let us know um i i try to stay off off social media um, just because again, actually it gets, it gets exhausting, but I, before that, I just, I thank you, uh, Lumi, because just when we started the conversation about being exhausted as black people, we're exhausted, but it, it's comforting to know. And I just, I get frustrated when people, the resources are there and people don't use them. Um, the white people don't use them to like educate themselves. And at that point, like I have to put you and I, I hate saying this, but I've been saying it since everything started back the first day of June. I have to put you in a box. Either you're, you're riding, you're coming to the cookout, I vibe with you or I don't F with you. And at a certain point, once I have that, then I have to decide what lane I'm going to be in. Because what's beautiful is now that America is not going to acknowledge racism in its past and won't acknowledge their problem. But the fact that I appreciate you for, again, I, I found you by happenstance and you were talking about uh, Black Wall Street. And that was like four weeks ago. And I'm like, she's on Twitch or, or they are on Twitch and they are making sure they are spreading knowledge to everybody about Black Wall Street. And I stayed. I'm like, what are they doing? They're like, this is amazing. And I, I was like, I thought Twitch was like this whole thing of like gaming and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But they are doing something that is so progressive that I'm like, let me let me reach out because I want to be a part of that. And now that I have this, like knowing my lane of education is going to be my lane and you're going to see black people are starting to pick a lane, stick in that lane and make sure that the people that can, we can reach can reach out. So my, my main source that I, I, I'm using now is my I have my your pusher man on uh, Twitch that I stream games. Um, I'm taking a break from division until stuff comes out, but I'm, I'm going to start streaming, um, Ghost of Tsushima when it comes out. Cause I got to pay homage to, you know, knowing about Japanese culture. Um, but then my educational stuff, I'm trying to build up my educational Twitch, uh, the art or art of Harkness, um, which is streaming right now, this conversation, I'm gonna start building that up so that once the school year starts, so all summer, I'm just going to dive into like the resources and having these conversations so that when school starts, I can then have my classroom be a virtual classroom on Twitch and like shift the paradigm of education where 
like my website, Art of Harkness, um, my Twitter, Instagram are all Art of Harkness. And I want to make sure I keep the educational conversation going, but then also show my my students that I'm a gamer, but I'm also an educator. And they, they both go hand in hand because I'm all about, you know, leveling up, getting XP, gaining knowledge and and building with people who along this journey of life, we are actually building and growing together to build a more better place. That's just how I see it. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm with that. That's, that's dope. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. I was just going to say, if you want any help, I know I went switched from gaming a long while back to <laughs> teaching on feminist issues. Uh, before, I, before I get into that, I wanted to say um, thank you for the appreciation on me sitting there and learning black history a little bit with my channel. I can't take the credit for that. I have to say my chat. That's one of the things I do is we'll sit here and we'll talk and we'll learn together and they bring something up. I don't know about it. I start learning about it. So I have to thank the um, black members of our or I have to thank black members of our community for bringing these things up as well as just um, all the diversity in our community. You speaking up on issues that I can go and learn about and we can learn together and grow um, our understanding of those those issues, whether they be black issues, um, issues around uh, disability, issues around queerness, all of these areas. So thank you to my community for that. But um, secondarily, if you do start, uh, as it sounds, you are planning to um, build an educational channel, feel free to reach out to me. I would love to see that. I um have a few people like juice box and and other people who are looking to talk about these issues of social justice um and and uh black rights other issues so if you ever want to have panels on particular topics i'm sure i've got plenty of people who would love to join you and uh, i'm more than willing to help out with the the technical issues as well because <laughs> they can yeah. be wild as everyone <laughs> saw um but juice what about you um so yeah definitely you, you got a you got a bunch of resources uh you can uh, access through lumi's uh lumi's community here so definitely feel free if you ever need help with anything like like i said anybody you need to come on uh, have a panel on or have on on your panel or whatever want to talk you guys want to talk about gaming like I'm, I'm down for that too you know just you know we're we're here we're here all these um, that's awesome i i appreciate i i appreciate yeah. that that's one of those things where it's one thing it's twitch has this this um like line where gamers will talk about gaming and i'm like at, at this point i had to put down the game and say the streamers i follow are they talking about these issues and they're not and i'm like i get it Gaming is our escape, but mm -hmm. I need to, to to express myself. And then Lumi was talking, and then I joined, and I joined Discord. And Juice, you were the first mod I saw on, and I was like, "Hey, Juice, can can you put me on Discord?" And so we got that going. And it's just your community is amazing. Like seeing and being in chat and just learning about stuff I've never learned about is is amazing. And yeah, your chat. And I know, I mean, I could shout out a few people, but even on our Discord on the the um the race topics. We go back and forth and have great discussions. And I, I appreciate everybody who has been there because this is, it's, I feel connected still thousands of miles away. And I want to bring that to my students who realize I have students right now who are in battles with the, you know, admin and stuff talking about, you know, can we talk about Black Lives Matter? Can we do this stuff? And they're looking to the Black staff. And so that's why I want to start doing this because I want them to realize that their voices can be heard especially when they want to talk about these issues and we are talking about it and I want to bring them on so that they can also have a voice to say, well, I want to ask this that way. They're able to do that. And I, I, I appreciate both of y'all and your chat. I appreciate everybody. You guys are just, you're awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sure. So for sure. Thank you. Um, both. Mm -hmm. Real quick. Uh, that was going to shout out my, my, my social media a little bit. Um, so, uh, on, on, Follow me on Instagram as Juicebox, as it's spelled in, in chat, you know, lowercase J-B-O-K-S. Um, I post a lot of my, uh, or most of my poems that I write, 
on there and i'm actually in the pro in the process of coming out this year that's my big um that's my big end goal uh so compile uh, a list of my poems into a book that i can you know something uh physical that i can have and show people whenever they if they're like interested in the work that i do um yeah follow me on that on that uh, you can also follow me on twitter or at Juice Boxmon, I'll put that in the in the chat right there. And um, I post a lot of ra a random stuff, whatever is really whatever, whatever is on my mind. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's more solemn. You're like, you know what you get until you start following. So check that out. Besides that, um, I'm on Discord, of course, Juice Box in in your server. A shout out everybody that. All my friends that came through and uh, everybody that supported me in, in doing this uh, talk. I see you, Jared, and uh, Chris. I see you, too, and uh, people from Comic Line, if you're here, too. Appreciate you uh, watching me uh, and listening to me talk for now. Uh, I know y'all y'all have been pushing me to do more stuff like this, so I really appreciate you coming out and, and supporting. Like it, it means a lot, and of course, everybody in the in in the community as well. Like I, I appreciate you guys. You've been so supportive and so helpful, and errors and helped me get through this. Like it's it's you guys are awesome for real. Thank you both so much for joining me, and thank you for everyone who swung by to support uh, Juice, your pusherman, or um, or just the panel as a whole. So thank you. Thank you both so much for joining me. I appreciate the heck out of that. I hope to see you both around. Feel free to reach out to me. Of course, Juice, you know, you can't get away from me. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a here. <laughs> you're stuck being anywhere. a mod. That's rough. But uh, don't <laughs> hesitate to reach out to me. Um, you're a pusher man. I really appreciate you and, and what you're doing. It's so inspiring to see someone um being the kind of teacher that you are and still working activism in with that that's incredible